Welcome to the History of Dark Ages England, episode 19, it's murder when you're a king. In 975, Edgar died suddenly, aged 32, and Edward the Martyr was proclaimed king. However, he was the son of Athelflaed, Edgar's first wife. In 978, he was invited down to Corf Castle near the Dorset coast. As he arrived on March 18th in the courtyard, some retainers came up to him and stabbed him to death. Corf Castle was the residence of Eilfthrith, Edgar's second wife, mother of the second Ethelred who was proclaimed king a month later. The worth of the crown was tarnished and never really recovered in his long reign. From that point, it was downwards for the prosperity and peace of the country. In 979, the same year as Athelred ascended the throne, according to the Anglo-Saxon chronicle, the skies above England appeared blood red as late as midnight. As portents of disaster go, this one was spot on. In 980, the Viking raids resumed. The first was seven ships at Southampton, where most of the inhabitants were killed or taken hostage. Later in the same year, Thanet and then Cheshire were raided. There was a break of a few months then 981 and 982 they resumed, but these were relatively small compared with the raiding armies of Alfred's day and had little effect on the economy. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle goes quiet for about six years on the subject. Then in 988, the year of Archbishop Dunstan's death, there is a new assault in Devon, but was met with great resistance by the Thanes of that area. These events brought to head frictions that had been increasing between England and the new realm of Normandy. The Danes had strong ties with the Normans, or Northmen, and had been using the Norman ports as refuge points. Athelvad had appealed to Pope John XV to intervene. He sent an envoy from Rome to negotiate a treaty between Athelvad and Duke Richard I of Normandy. Both sides seem to have been able to draw up what they considered friendly terms. This cooled tensions for the time being. They had agreed not to harbour each other's enemies and to provide reparations for any previous infringements. Then, after further minor raids by the Vikings in 991, a full raiding army of 93 ships led by Olaf Trigvason swooped on Ipswich which proved highly profitable. They then moved down to Malden in the Blackwater estuary to Northy Island, which had a causeway to the mainland at low tide. Trigvason had demanded a ransom to go away. Alderman Byanoth of Essex, who was leading the defence, refused, stating they would throw spears for a ransom. The Vikings were effectively stuck on the island, and when they tried to get to the mainland were stopped by as few as three Anglo-Saxons holding the causeway, very reminiscent of Horatio holding the bridge in Rome. After some catcalling, Byanoth agreed to allow the Vikings to come to the mainland to engage battle. The problem was he foolishly held to his word and allowed all the Vikings to come across, instead of allowing, say, a, a third or half across, and then smashing and killing those to leave a reduced army more vulnerable to other attacks. In the ensuing battle, the two metres high Bayern North was an easy target, which the Vikings aimed for, and cutting their way through to him, the 65 years old giant was slain, leaving the Anglo-Saxons without their most obvious leader. His close companions falling by his body, the day was lost. In the subsequent flight, any Anglo-Saxons were felled without mercy. One can criticise Byadnoth for allowing the full army to cross the causeway and gather its strength, but Byadnoth probably wanted revenge for the devastation of Ipswich. However, his biggest mistake was down to honour and keeping his word. 
Had he attacked while the Vikings still had a large bulk of its force on the island, he would have got his revenge and probably victory, which counts for more. No doubt he wanted to be honoured in song and poem as a man of his word, but it's much better to win. Most of what we know about the Battle of Malden is in a poem. Alas, what was to follow meant hardship for all of England. The poem is regarded as fiction in some quarters as it was written a good 40 years after the events. However, the ASC states that Byadnoth was killed at Malden and there is no reason to doubt that the idyll is based on some points of fact. Olaf Tryggvason demanded £10,000, a truly colossal sum, and with the recommendation of Archbishop Cedric to Athelrad to pay, which shows how rich the realm had become that it could be paid. A tax was made throughout the kingdom and the first Danegeld was paid. No reason is given as to why Athelrad did not try to raise an army. The nickname of Athelrad is unready. This is actually a pun. Athel means noble or royal and raid is counsel. So unread or unraid is unwise counsel or badly advised, which at its best it is. At worst, it is actually quite offensively negative, stupidly advised or counselled by the devil. But he certainly fits the modern day meaning of unready. It's an understatement. In fact, Athelred is prominent by his absence. When he arrives on the scene, it is to concur the peace treaty drawn up by Cedric and Trigvesen. This agrees that each side will come to the aid of the other and that trading and commerce will be protected in each other's waters. And Athelrad, the naive, believes all this. After the defeat at Malden in 991 and paying Olaf Trygvason his £10,000 in Danegeld, the country was in shock. The following year, 992, it is decided something should be done and Athelrad gathers the fleet at London in an attempt to entrap the next raiders. At this point, one of his advisers says, oh, they should warn the raiders. What? Whether the original plan is to deter them early on and so save life and cost is not explained in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. But Elfric, who was the court official for the idea, goes and warns the raiding army just before it is trapped and it escapes. This left Athelrad looking a little silly. In 993, Bamber and the Humber estuary were raided, and it is said that when a great army was assembled, the earls Freyna, Godwin and Frithogist flew first to flight with no sound of Athelrad to do anything. Then 994, Trigvason, a future king of Norway by the way, returned with Swain, son of Harald, king of Denmark, and a fleet of 94 ships. They attack London on the 8th of September, the nativity of St Mary the Virgin, but they were ferociously repulsed by the townspeople, who attributed in large part their victory to intervention by the Blessed Virgin Mother. The Viking army retreated, but devastated the surrounding villages and countryside, causing as much distress and damage as possible in Essex and Kent. They then made their way along the coast through to Sussex and Hampshire, causing added destruction designed to deliver Dengeld to the maximum amount. In this case, £16,000. That was not the end. Once you've paid the Dengeld, the Danes will be back for more. In the next episode, we'll follow that up. If you found this video greatly, give it a thumbs up. I publish new ones every Monday with occasional episodes on a Thursday. Also, please comment and spread the word on social media outlets. Any mentions on Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, you know the stuff, will be greatly appreciated. Thank you.